Maybe you wish for one word in English and one word in French. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and which one's good? Okay. Well, <laughs> that's the way I speak anyway. So. <laughs> no, you, you switch language every time you switch off the, that's right. the that's level right. in your. Oh, right. Wow. Wow. So, the talk is in two parts. Huh? The first one until uh, lunch, and then uh, Marcel will break you. So, so until you're 12. Or, or if you prefer to switch to make it in, as you wish, but you will see. No, no, it's good. It's good, I think, to have a change. So it's until, until 12, right? Until 12. So, so I'll talk about uh, sort of running uh, feature hierarchies, or running features in general, but hierarchical features in, in particular. Um, and um, I'll talk about this as kind of a, perhaps a semi-general model of of uh, object recognition, or at least fast object recognition of the kind that uh, Simon was talking about yesterday. We're going to model, you know, complicated uh, uh, processes like, uh, you know, uh, things that would require time for humans to kind of figure out. Um, so uh, I think it's actually a big challenge uh, for, that, that hasn't been really, uh, sort of hasn't uh, motivated a lot of work yet. And the big challenge is, is how do we learn representations? And it's a problem not just for machine learning, where, which is where I come from, or not just for computer vision, where, which, you know, which I'm also active as well, but also for AI in general and, and neuroscience uh, as well. Uh, so there's a lot of work in machine learning on how to, how to learn classifiers and predictors. Uh, but very, very, very little work on how you learn features. There's a lot of work in computer vision on how you design features but ready to work on how you learn features, although that's changing quickly. Uh, the same is true in speech recognition. There was, uh, there's been a lot of work for many, many years on how you learn uh, you know, sequence classifiers, basically. And there's a bit of, of work on sort of learning mid-level features for acoustic modeling. So they call this acoustic modeling with things like mixture, mixture of Gaussian models and things of that type. Um, but the low-level features are, are generally fixed, and, uh, and the systems are shallow in the sense that they, they only have just a couple stages of processing uh, uh, in them. And so, um, you know, we're asking the question, how do we learn representation? It's really the more general question of how do we learn perception uh, in general? And I'm sort of going to try to assume that, or make the hypothesis that, um, if, we're, if you're interested in neuroscience, that essentially every stage of the process of perception is trained uh, in the brain. But there's some evidence that that's actually the case. Um, evidence uh, through uh, experiments that were done at uh, MIT of, uh, quite a long time ago of sort of rewiring the brain of uh, baby ferrets so that the auditory nerve would be connected to the visual cortex and the you know, uh, optical nerve to the auditory cortex. Actually, it's more the, the latter one that's interesting. And if you connect the uh, optical nerve to the auditory cortex of a ferret uh, baby, the auditory cortex develops orientation selection cells of the types that you would normally find in the visual cortex. So what, what that would suggest is that uh, the function that a particular area of the brain uh, implements doesn't have much to do with uh, the place it's, it's located in, in the brain, but it has to do with the type of signal it's getting, and therefore there's some sort of running algorithm going on that builds the function that this particular part of the brain uh, does, and it's pretty much the same running algorithm running all over, algorithm in double quotes, running all over the cortex. Um, so what's the learning algorithm of the cortex? And if you could figure this out, we could probably uh, advance both uh, computer vision, AI, uh, machine learning, uh, and our understanding of, uh, of how the brain works. Um, maybe that algorithm doesn't exist, but I think it's a good working hypothesis to, uh, to uh, say that it does. Um, so what, uh, what does that mean for, for, uh, for, for machine learning? How should we do things differently? Um, so uh, the, the classical, uh, model of pattern recognition is, uh, is well known, is this. You, you start with an input, you have some sort of handcrafted feature extractor, and you stick your favorite classifier on top, and, um, and that's how almost every recognition system is built. Although, more recently, uh, uh, even sort of mainstream recognition systems in uh, computer vision and speech recognition have been more of this type, where you have fixed low-level features in speech, they call them SECs or things like that, in vision, there are things like sit and hug and 
binary patterns and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, a long list of these guys, a, a, a whole menagerie. Um, what people have been doing in the last, I would say, six years or so, is uh, have a, another stage in the, mi in, the mid in the middle here that extracts mid-level features. And this almost systematically uses some sort of learning, and almost always some sort of unsupervised learning. Um, so uh, the early models of computer vision uh, for object recognition about uh, 10 years ago or six years ago used uh, a very simple k-means algorithm clustering, basically, to figure out what the features were at this, uh, at this level. Uh, the more recent one used sparse coding and various other you know, variations of that. And then you stick your favorite classifier, all right? So the standard pipeline now, it used to be this, handcrafted features, classifier. Now it's handcrafted features, some sort of unsupervised learning, and your classifier. And that's supervised, of course. Um, but really, uh, so I stole this picture from Simon. I like it a lot. Thanks. <laughs> I don't have the cute animation. Uh, uh, okay, that's, that's very expensive. That one. Okay. <laughs> um, so you saw that already. Uh, you know, so that suggests that the process is not just kind of a three-stage process. It's kind of much more hierarchical in a way. And maybe it's only three stages if you kind of forget about V2 and this, you know. Forget about the retina and LGN, just, you know, so V1, V4, IT, that's sort of three stages. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, there is the virtual and dorsal pathway, the, you know, this, these are sort of other uh, diagrams uh, of the visual cortex. There are more hairy ones uh, that for, by Von Essen, we have all kinds of boxes with all kinds of wires going everywhere, everywhere from everywhere to everywhere. Um, but here we sort of limit ourselves to sort of the feed forward uh, ventral uh, pathway that is, is is uh, thought to um, uh, uh, recognize objects, essentially. Um, now, why, why would we do this with vision as opposed to something else? And in fact, it's, uh, it may not be such a good idea. I think the, the idea of learning features is much more popular right now in speech recognition than it is in vision. There's much more resistance to this in sort of mainstream vision to, to doing this kind of stuff. Uh, but the reason I think vision is interesting is because it's, it's iner inherently complex. Uh, you know, biology hasn't found ways around spending a third of our brains on vision. And, uh, and when you think about how expensive a big brain is, um, that means, and so the you know, enormous evolutionary pressure there is to kind of reduce the size of the, of the, of the brain or, or make a, a particular function in the brain as small as possible, you know, the fact that vision uses a third of it uh, tells you that it's, it's, a, it's a complex task. So if you can you know, do some interesting things in vision with machine learning algorithms, we can probably do a lot more things. You know, once we've done vision, you know, we can do audition because it's tiny. You know, we can do language because it's basically, you know, the size of your, you know, pinky. Um, you know, language is, you know, trivial, essentially. Um, in, in neural terms, right? Um, so, uh, so let's do the hard things first. <laughs> uh, um, so, you know, so it's a deep system um, in, uh, in, in primates, uh, probably in rodents too, I'm not sure. I don't know much about the rodent visual system, but I think it's also fairly, uh, it's a kind of very similar structure. Um, and the question, of course, is do you, how do you train a, a deep neural net? Um, and so that's, that's what uh, people have been worried, worrying about. You know, it's sort of small cabal of people have been uh, wondering about for the last uh, six or seven years or so, or at least have been advertising the fact that they are actually interested in this problem for the last five or six years, but most of us have been interested in it for the last 25 years. Um, uh, so the question is, how do you train deep, deep uh, neural nets? Um, and you, you would think you could use backprop. In fact, the big hope about uh, backpropagation back in the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s, was that we were going to be able to learn internal representations. One of the title of the foundational papers on backprop by, uh, by, by Jeff Hinton is, you know, learning internal representations through backpropagation. So the whole problem was about learning representations. And it kind of died out a little bit because um, it doesn't quite work for sort of generic networks, but it works really well for things like conventional networks, so as I'll show you uh, later. Um, so back in the old days, uh, uh, deep learning was essentially supervised backpropagation. Uh, but more recently, the reason people got more interested in this uh, more recently is that uh, um, it turns out that unsupervised pre-training before supervised uh, fine-tuning can help a lot. Um, so the model we are hoping to, to get at with uh, deep learning is something more like this, where 
each you have kind of a sequence of stages if you want, and each stage is trainable and turns the some sort of low level representation into some sort of slightly higher level representation. And as you go up the layers, the representation gets more global, more invariant, more sensitive to things you, you care about and things like that. Uh, so that's the, the idea of uh, hierarchy of uh, trained uh, features. Um, so you asked the, you, you talked about deep learning to a theoretician, like say, Vlatnik. Um, so, you know, Vlatnik and I, Vlatnik was in my lab uh, for, for a very long time. Uh, I was his boss for six years, believe it or not. Um, and you, you tell me about deep learning, and he says, I don't understand. He <laughs> said, so, why do you need that at all? You know, write your kernel function and then do a linear combination of this. You can approximate any function you want with this, provided you have the right kernel. Why would you need deep learning at all? Um, and that's interesting coffee discussions again. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, you know, in a sense that's true, but the, the, problem, the problem, of course, is that there is no bound on how many of those terms in the sum you may have for a particular problem. So there are sort of interesting papers by uh, um, Joshua Benjo, among others, and uh, Joshua and I also have some paper with sort of, sort of hand wavy arguments for uh, why this form of parameterization of function is very inefficient in a lot of different cases. Basically functions that are very sort of irregular. If you want. Um, and, and so the form of, of deep learning is more something like this where you have a succession of linear and nonlinear operations that you kind of uh, stack. Um, or you know something like that, rather. This is kind of a two-layer net. That's still kind of a little shadow and then you can sort of stack multiple uh, layers. And so why is it that maybe some of the functions that we're interested in implementing with uh, you know, you know, things like computer vision and things like that, why is it that they would be more efficiently represented by something like this by, than by something like that or like that? And it's a fair question to ask, and there is no real good answer to this. There are sort of hand wavy you know, semi-theoretical arguments of the type, um, well, think about Boolean functions. Uh, in fact, I have something like this here. Um, uh, you can implement any Boolean function of n bits, let's say, in two layers. You need one layer of n's and one layer of ors, and then a, you know, a few nots in between. Um, that's the conjunctive normal form or, di or disjunctive normal form of a, of a Boolean function. So you can implement any Boolean function with two layers. The problem is, of course, most Boolean functions of n inputs will require very close to 2 to the n uh, min terms in the formula. Is in fact an exponentially small number of uh, functions that do not require an exponential number of midterms. So, um, so the, the functions that you can implement with less than exponential resources is, is tiny with two layers. If you allow yourself to add more layers, then it's a completely different picture. There's a whole bunch of functions now that become linear, polynomial, or non exponential, in, in the, uh, you know, where the, the number of components you have to use uh, becomes uh, non intractable as a function of number of inputs. So think of uh, you know parity for example. Uh, you know parity you can compute in two layers, but it requires an exponential number of midterms. But if you allow yourself a number of layers equal to log of the number of inputs, then uh, it's linear. Uh, think of addition. So if you want to add two binary numbers, um, you know you can you can do it in two layers. Uh, but I guarantee you your Intel chip doesn't do that. Um, it doesn't take two 32 bit num. Uh, you know, integers and compute the sum of those uh, things with just two layers. It does it in multiple steps by propagating carries. Not every bit, but every few bits. And the reason is because uh, it, would, it would just be too expensive to do it in two steps. It would be faster, but you fill up the whole chip. Um, so, um, so these are sort of, you know, essentially slightly more kind of sequential type functions where you need multiple, you, know, you need depth to implement them um, uh, efficiently. And we've, we've all been confronted to this uh, problem by when we write code, you know, we always have the uh, option of uh, a piece of code that will take very little memory but take a long time, or a piece of code that will take much more memory but then will run faster, maybe using a little table or something. Right, so it's the same kind of uh, equivalence. The, the sort of shadow architecture are kind of like lookup tables, and the sort of deeper ones are more like algorithms. Um, Excuse me. Yes? Is that, um, has there been any work? Uh, trying to, to put, for instance, uh, deep belief networks uh, into um, circuit complexity classes. Yeah, and, then, and so there are results. I mean, not, it's not deep belief networks, but there is uh, a lot of work on circuit, <coughs> circuit complexity theory uh, on threshold functions. 
And, and so for things like parity, for example, you can do parity in uh, polynomial, I think it's polynomial, in two layers with threshold functions, um, which you can't do with binary, with you know, with normal Boolean functions. I mean, the, the n and ors, you have to use threshold functions. Um, so um, yeah, there's some work, but it, you know, not much is known below, beyond three layers, basically. It's, uh, it's, really, uh, it's very difficult. Um, okay, so let me sort of quickly review what uh, sort of the traditional way of doing deep learning, uh, uh, you know, vintage 1985, 1986 uh, was, and it's. Uh, you know, backprop. Uh, but it's kind of a slightly more general version of uh, a backprop that I'm going to tell you about. Um, so we think of backprop as, uh, you know, sort of inherently attached to normal. <coughs> backprop is just the general idea of computing, you know, gradients by going backwards through a feed forward structure. It doesn't matter what it is. And so imagine you have some sort of function that's composed of multiple blocks, functional blocks. And so those, those blocks take an input here, this red xi minus, uh, well, xi minus 1 here, and produce an output xi, and use uh, parameters wi to do this uh, computation. Uh, what backprop tells you is that, you know, basically chain rule tells you, if I know the derivative of some function with respect to the output of this block, then by multi multiplying this vector by the Jacobian of this box, I can compute the gradient of this function with respect to the input of this box. Now if I have that, then I can do the same with the next block and propagate back over, right? And I can do the same. This block has actually two Jacobians. One is uh, the Jacobian of uh, the output with respect to the input. The other one is Jacobian of the output with respect to the parameters. And I can do that too to uh, compute the gradients of, of the loss function with respect to the parameters, right? So I plug an input, propagate the input forward, uh, I measure some sort of function I want to minimize, and then uh, I compute the gradient of this function with respect to the input of this box. And then multiply by the Jacobian of this, and I have the gradient of the, the, this, this green thing here, the derivative of the function with respect to the input of that box and with respect to the parameter of that box, and then I can I keep, keep that propagating through. Um, so it's a very simple uh, algorithm, and you can implement this very simply by uh, uh, basically for every block you write, every function that you write, you, you, you have two functions one that says compute forward, the other one that says compute backwards, you know, multiply by my Jacobian. Um, and then you can assemble those blocks in sort of any, any way you want. It doesn't have to be a, a, a sequential structure like this. It could be you know, something more complicated, like you know, any kind of graph of, of interaction. So that, that makes kind of a very simple language to specify complex models that are parameterized. And you don't have to worry about how do you compute the gradient. This kind of comes for free from the, the structure of the graph. Um, so you, you can also handle uh, things like recurrent nets. Anyway, um, so uh, the problem, of course, is that as soon as you have uh, structures like this where the, the modules are nonlinear, uh, the functions you are likely to want to minimize will probably be non convex. And there's a disease in the machine learning community which is that people are completely scared of non convexity for some reason. Um, there's going to be a, like a, a Greek name for that, you know. Convexophobia, so not convex. <laughs> <laughs> Anti-convexophobia, yeah. That works. You can even tell this, right? Convex is Greek too, right? Isn't it? No. No? No, oh, that's Latin, unfortunately. Well, what's the Greek word for convex? <laughs> um, you know. uh, crypto. Crypto. Okay. So anti crypto phobia. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you know there are good reasons to be scared of non-convex optimization. It's a fact you're not guaranteed. You know you can't prove anything because you're not guaranteed that the system will find the global minimum. Blah blah blah. Um, but really, the, the the big question is, you know, does it do what you want? You know, does it work in the end, even if it uh, you have no guarantee, if, if your guarantees are weaker than than other ones? Um, so yeah, you're going to get non-convex optimization. Um, uh, but the problem is not as bad as people used to think it was. Um, so Back in the old days, when people started playing with with, uh, with multi-layer neural nets, they realized the optimization problem was difficult. But there's a lot of mistakes you can make to make it more difficult than it needs to be, and almost everybody did it this way. So, um, uh, so it turns out it's not as complex as people uh, uh, made it to be. Um, but it's still kind of strange. So you know, here's the simplest neural net you can imagine. It's uh, one input, one output, one hidden unit, uh, uh, two-layer neural net. So it's got only two ways, one way that goes from input to hidden, and one way that goes from hidden to output. 
And we're going to train this machine to learn the adaptive function, right? So plug in x, and you want to system to produce x on the output. Solution is trivial. If the hidden unit is linear, you want the first weight to be some value, and the second weight to be one over that value, so that they cancel out uh, when you go through. And so the solution is some sort of hyperbola, right? One weight is x, the other weight is one over x. So in the space of, of those two weights, the, solutions, the, the solution is you know, either this, on the other side, the both are negative, both are positive, and then in the middle you have this settle point. And uh, so if you start from some random position, let's say here, uh, what's going to happen first is that you're going to get pretty close to the settle point, and then eventually find one of those two. But you're going to have the system is going to have to break the symmetry between the two. It's going to have, and, and if you start from zero zero, you're not going anywhere. Uh, the gradient is zero. Uh, in fact, it's a very very flat surface because if you take a cross. Um, a cut across this function in this direction, what you get is a fourth degree polynomial, and you know the derivatives are all zero here. For you know, um, it's not good. Second derivative is zero too. So, um, um, <clears throat> so, so what's going to happen is that you're going to have to find an algorithm that breaks the symmetry in the system. And one mistake that people made with neural nets is to make them fully connected, completely. Uh, sort of undifferentiated if you want. The only way that you break the symmetry in a neural net is by initializing the weights to random values. And because of that, the hidden units start kind of specializing and do different things. But it's a very weak uh, way of breaking the symmetry. Um, and um, you know, um, we, were, we heard about symmetry before, so it's different kind of symmetry I'm talking about here. But if you take a fully connected neural net, you can uh, switch two neurons if you if you switch their weights as well, um, the neural net will do exactly the same function uh, under this uh, switch of the two things. And it's a reflection that corresponds to reflection in weight space, where you have two completely equivalent local minima. Um, um, and so the, the point uh, I want to get to with this is that if you have uh, a large neural net, multi large neural net, you're going to have lots and lots and lots of local minima that are essentially all equivalent. You're going to have local minima that are not equivalent, that are actually local minima, you know, not, not global minima. Um, and the uh, number of dimensions in, uh, in which you have solutions, as opposed to dim dimensions, directions in the parameter space in which you don't, um, is going to increase as you increase the size of the network. So if you have a network that's just the right size for the problem, you have very, very few of those uh, directions in which you, you have a solution. Most of them are like this, and so they're going to be very hard to find. But if you make the network much, much bigger than necessary, then you have lots of those, and they're very, very easy to find. So for example, if you want to think about this intuitively, imagine a two-layer neural net in which the first layer is essentially infinite, very, very, very large. Okay? So large, in fact, that pretty much every hidden unit you would ever want is already there. Okay? What that means is that when you're going to train this network, you don't actually, you don't actually have to train the first layer. You, do, you only need to train the second layer. The first layer already has what you need. Um, so it's only a matter of training the second layer so that it selects the right subset of hidden units, right? So that's an example of essentially backward training with two layers, but you push it in, a, in, a, in such a corner that the non-convexity the non of the cost function doesn't matter anymore. Uh, you know, you just go into the second layer and that's fine. Uh, in fact, that's exactly what SVMs are. Um, so SVMs uh, take the input, expand this input into a, a large dimensional space, so this is not the mathematical abstraction of, uh, of the kernel space. This is, uh, what I'm talking about here is the space of outputs of the first layer of an SVM, which is basically the uh, output of the application of the kernel function to the input paired with one of the training samples, right? So what you get is a big vector whose size is the, the number of training samples, or slightly less, the number of super vectors. Um, and then you compute a linear combination, and you only have to run the second layer because you've uh, expanded the first layer so much that you know you uh, need to run the first layer anymore. Um, um, but that's a bit of a kind of expensive thing to do, um, and it's only two layers. Okay, um, so here's a way to break the symmetry: make your network non-fully connected and give it some structure that takes advantage of the structure of the input that you're dealing with. And what, what I'm going to uh, uh, focus on here is. Um, uh, dealing with uh, array data. So data that comes to you in the form of a table, an array of numbers, in such a way that neighboring values in the array uh, are correlated. Okay, so for example, think about an image. Neighboring pixels in an image are likely to be uh, 
similar. Uh, more likely to be similar than far away pixels. So that means there are local correlations between uh, pixels in an image. And if there are local correlations, that means that not all possible random combinations of, of pixel values, uh, of neighboring pixel values, are possible. There's a lot of structure, right? Uh, so if I take, say, uh, five by five patch, uh, patches or nine by nine patches of uh, pixels from all kinds of natural images, and I try to figure out how much of the 81 dimensional uh, space, nine by nine, 81 dimensional space um, of, of possible pixel value is actually occupied by patches or natural uh, images. It's a very small piece of that space. Um, at least with sort of high density. Um, so what that tells you is that there is an advantage in encoding local patches of, uh, of pixels because since not all combinations are possible, there is, there's got to be a way of encoding it in such a way that, that you win, that you don't need as, as many as A1 dimensions, for example, to uh, encode uh, A1 pixels. Um, okay, uh, but going back to sort of the more uh, the, the architectural question is, uh, I showed the, the um, the diagram earlier of the feature transform, and one question we have to ask ourselves is, what do we put in the boxes? And I've come to converge towards this sort of basic architecture of what the kind of feature transform function should be. Basically, you start with some sort of normalization. Uh, if you're a single processing person, think of it as whitening, uh, carrying on wave transform, if you want, or you know, ZCA or something like that, or the poor man's version of it. So if you are dealing with images, that means uh, high-pass filtering followed by contra local contrast normalization. Basically, what you observe the LGN is doing. That's pretty much what the LGN does. Um, so some sort, of, some sort of, you know, decor local decorrelation of, of things, basically, and, and contrast enhancement and normalization of, uh, of variance of energy. Then you, you put a filter bank or linear transform, you know, a matrix multiplication. In the case of images, it would be more like a, a, a bunch of, of conventional filters. Some sort of nonlinear operation, and I'm not restricting myself to pointwise nonlinearities, I see it. Uh, it could be, you know, complicated things like winner take all or, um, you know, uh, competitive things of various kinds, lateral inhibition, blah, blah, blah. Some sort of nonlinear function here, you know, thresholding, all kind of stuff. And then a feature pooling operation. And, what, um, and so what these two boxes are going to do is expand the, the input into a higher dimensional space in a nonlinear way. And the nonlinearity is very important. If, it's, if there is no nonlinearity, there's no point in doing any, any of this. Okay? And this is going to explode your space into all kinds of little um, you know, boxes, if you want. So if you, if you look at the set of possible configurations that you will observe after the filter bank and nonlinearity here, this may be higher dimension than what comes in, and uh, things are going to be exploded, right? Uh, things that maybe nearby in that space may end up being very different in that other space, in, in very different locations. So then there is a, a pooling operation, and the role of the pooling operation is to regroup things that are semantically similar, okay? So, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, this little widget in this position and that position is really the same widget. At some level, I should really have the same representation for it. And so uh, if, if, if this corresponds to a particular configuration of features at one level, and this to another configuration of, feature, of features, and somehow those two things occur in different subsets of features, if I pull them together, um, I'll have one common invariant representation for those two locations of, of this object. Okay, so that's the role of pooling. We can either build this explicitly by hand, or we can learn it. And we're going to repeat this process multiple times. Here, here only two stages, um, but, uh, but we can repeat it more times. Um, and if you think about this, this is basically just uh, you know Google Resolve NT62, right? You have uh, LGN, uh, V1 simple cells, complex cells, and then do the same with V2, V4, whatever. And then this is IT. Maybe you can have another stage in between. Um, so the pooling operation is going to be something that is going to is going to have to be some operation that uh, takes a bunch of arguments and combines them, aggregates them in a way that doesn't um, where the order of the arguments doesn't matter. So any function where the order of the argument doesn't matter is a good pooling function. So average is a good pooling function, max is a good pooling function, LP norm is a good pooling function. Uh, you know, 
log of some of the exponential is a good cooling function. Uh, some people call, call this softmax, but uh, softmax is also used for something else, so I'm not sure. Um, Um, this known plus false bank thing that you equate to um, to the LGN. Uh, no, uh, sorry, 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 just the known, just the known. Sorry, yes. Uh, so you 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 need it. It's it, it's in every one of your modules. Yeah. Uh, if you think of, about them as uh, regions in in the central stream, for instance, mm -hmm. it means that uh, whatever the, the LGN was doing, it has to be done again and again every time you switch from one region to the next. Is, sure. is there any? Yeah. Evidence that this, uh, I mean, you know, the, um, basically what you need is, is uh, divisive normalization. That's, that's it's the only thing. This does um, local decorrelation, which can be done with local with lateral inhibition, and we know that exists. And then the second operation is uh, divisive contrast normalization, and we know that exists at least in D1. Uh, at least there are lots of papers on this uh, by some of my colleagues at NYU, David Higer, or some of Shelley, all, all, all kinds of models about this. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it, it's actually a very well, I mean, at least at the front end, it's a very well accepted um, uh, function. Mm. Further up, oh, that's our Yes. Yeah, you uh, equate uh, the classifier with ID, right? But uh, ideally, we don't need that stage, right? We just uh, stack uh, these, these uh, unsupervised learning stages on top of each other. Right. And well, we just get our concepts out. Yeah, really, I don't think of the last layer as being different from the other ones. In fact, it could be exactly the same structure. Yeah. I mean, because you know, linear classifier is nothing more than a photograph, really, with a nonlinearity. It's, it's just the same. So, yeah. Um, so you know, as I said, this is very, uh, very much uh, the same as kind of a generalization of, if you want, of kind of simple cell complex cell models. And the funny thing is, uh, it's also turns out to be pretty much what people use in sort of mainstream standard computer vision algorithms. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, so the idea of using architectures like this in the case of images with kind of convolutional filters and you know competitive uh, nonlinearities and some normalization, feature pooling and unsupervised learning, I guess that goes back to Fukushima in the 70s and 80s with the neural parking tron in the 80s. I've been working with uh, things like this, you know, particularly for image and speech uh, since the mid 80s. And the stuff was, as I was mentioning before, reinvented by uh, uh, Tony Poggio in the mid 2000s uh, before I realized that was done before. But um, and now there's a lot of people working with these things. Um, so that's the sort of particular instantiation of this for images, which we call convolutional nets. Um, and, and there's sort of several, uh, you know, uh, incarnations of this with, with different types of running algorithms, different types of nonlinearities, different types of normalization. This one is a fairly kind of straightforward one uh, for, for image recognition. Um, let me show you. Okay, so here's a, an example of, this is an old uh, convolutional net I trained back in the early 90s, 90s for uh, handwriting recognition. And I'm showing this to you to, to so this was trained entirely supervised. The nonlinearities are hyperbolic tangents, uh, sigmoid functions. Uh, there's no normalization there, it's, uh, it's just, you know, filter banks and hyperbolic tangents, and the pooling is an average pooling. Um, and what you see here is the input, that's the result of applying six uh, trained filters to the first layer and passing it through a sigmoid function. Then uh, that's the result of doing the pooling operation over two by two uh, numbers, you just computing an average. Then passing that result through a sigmoid function with a bias, which is why the gray scale is different here. Uh, and then you repeat the process, that's the second stage. Each of these guys is a result of a weighted sum over a local neighborhood of uh, multiple of these guys summed up, then passed through a nonlinearity. And this guy is the same, except with different filters that combine the features on the previous layer, etc. Then you pull again, and then again another set of filters with nonlinearities, and the classifier is not represented here. Right? So it's, it's a bit like a three-stage system. And here is what I want you to look at. So if I look at this particular pixel here, it goes from white to black to white. Okay. What that means is that in the space of pixels. The, the curve that's formed by all the, dis, all the translated trees is a very highly nonlinear curve, right? Because one of, the, one of the components, one of the coordinates goes from, uh, say, 0 to 1 to 0, okay? So, um, so it has to have some curvature. In fact, it has a huge curvature. Because um, there's lots of those pixels that go from white to black to white, and, you know, um, 
but if you look at, um, so what that means, it's a problem because what that means is uh, the manifold of all possible distorted versions of three, or all possible three, uh, threes that can be sort of continuously deformed from, from, from each other, is kind of a very curvy, twisty surface in this high dimensional space. Now the, the second problem is that, now if I close the three to an eight, it's also going to be a very twisty surface, but it's going to be very, very nearby the, the first one. In fact, it's going to be very hard to tell one from the other. Uh, I'm not going to be able to separate them with a linear classifier, for example. It's going to be very hard to do that. Okay? Because the curves are all, because the surfaces are all very sort of entangled. In the field. They don't touch, uh, but they're, they're very sort of entangled. Now, if you look at the representation that the system has learned here, after we've trained this with backprop, the filters train themselves, so the first layer filters do things like edge extraction, and second layer filters do, you know, I have no idea what they do. And now, if you look at this representation, a single column here corresponds to a 32 by 32 window on the input, which basically contains the entire character. And if you look at the values here, there's hardly any value that goes from white to black to white or the other way around. They all go from gray to less gray or more gray, right? What does that mean? That means in this space, which is sort of you know, relatively high dimensional relative to the input, the, the manifold of distorted three is flat, sort of. It's not flat, but it's kind of flat. And so you can imagine it would be more easier to be easier to separate that manifold of all the threes from the manifold of all eights or fives uh, if, they're, if they're flat. In fact, the reason they're flat is because the whole thing is trained so that a linear classifier stuck on top of this would actually be able to do the classification, so it's no surprise. Okay. Uh, but that suggests kind of a good criterion for how to train uh, deep systems, uh, perhaps in a non-supervised way, which would be to try to disentangle and flatten out uh, manifolds of variations of individual categories. <coughs> it's kind of semi-supervised because you have to know if two objects are from the same category. Um, now, back to sort of uh, the same architecture I was talking about before. I kind of got rid of the normalization here, but I should put it back. Um, and I want to draw a parallel between this architecture that's been around for a very long time. You went with all 1962, Fukushima, 70s and 80s, uh, you know, my group of bell labs in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, you know, Tony Bojo in the mid 2000s and early 2000s, and then a lot more people since then. Uh, so the interesting thing about this, uh, this kind of architecture is that um, uh, the mainstream computer vision uh, systems that are now the most popular ones for, for you know, standard object recognition pretty much fall into the same sort of architecture. And this is not a, this is not a critique at all. This is not to say that you know, all the stuff that computer vision people do now was invented by neuroscientists in the 60s. I'm not making that claim. What I'm claiming is that there is some sort of convergence uh, between, you know, between all the things that people have seem to be converging towards the same kind of architecture. So if you think about uh, a SIFT or a HOG, which are the, the two most popular feature extraction methods in computer vision, you can pre pretty much kind of fit SIFT and HOG in those, in those three boxes. Okay, so HOG, or SIFT for example, extracts uh, uh, dominant directions of edges in a, in a patch. Uh, so you can think of this as two filters and a winner take all, essentially, or it's not a winner take all, but it's more like a figuring out a, a dominant direction, essentially. Um, and then you do this over multiple patches in a local area, and, uh, and you average them out. And that's just a cooling operation, essentially. There's also a normalization coming on afterwards. So SIFT actually has a normalization not at the input of the next block, but at the output of the first block. You know, that's kind of the detail of, of how you name things. And so it's, uh, it's very interesting that, uh, you, know, it, you know, basically it's very hard to get out of this model of filtering nonlinearity and pooling. And the pooling operation is, is because you want local invariance to small distortions and things of that type. HOG is very much the same type of model. In fact, it's probably even closer to uh, biology than uh, SIFT. Um, and if you ask uh, David Lowe, he will tell you, you know, uh, it's you know, very much inspired by, uh, by V1. So it's no, no surprise, um, and 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 you know, I don't want to belittle the contribution of David Lowe or uh, or Bill Triggs. They, they you know, their uh, their their feature extractors have been extremely useful to everybody. 
Um, then the second stage in most uh, mainstream uh, object recognition systems are based on unsupervised training. So the filter bank is basically the result of training, um, uh, you know, doing, doing k-means uh, clustering or sparse coding on whatever comes out of the previous layer. And, uh, and you can think of the filters uh, as the prototypes of k-means or as the basis functions of sparse coding in a way. The non-linearity in the case of k-means is just a winner take all, right? So basically, you do uh, uh, k-means clustering. Once you have the prototype, um, you represent uh, every piece of, uh, of uh, you know, patch or feature vector from the previous layer here as a long feature vector with k components, where all the components are zero except for one that's equal to one. And that's the one corresponding to the prototype that is closest to the input. So we could think of this filter bank and, and, and we don't take all in the case of uh, vector quantization as basically a, a big uh, dimensionality expansion uh, with k uh, dimensions uh, and, but, and, and as producing a very, very, very sparse representation where only one component is one and all the other ones are zero. Okay? So k-means k or vector quantization is the ultimate sparse code. Why would you want to do this? Um, uh, you know, what's, what's this whole story about expanding the dimension into a sparse uh, space? Uh, the reason for this is that uh, in high dimensional sparse spaces, most functions are linear. Um, it's a trick that a lot of people have used over, you know, in, the, in history, physicists and, uh, you know, probabilistic modelers and so on. So think about, uh, say, um, think about a Markov model, for example, right? So a Markov model, uh, is linear as a linear transition matrix from state at time t to state at time t plus one. Why would it be linear? It's linear because you have one dimension for every possible things that the, every possible state that the system can be in. Um, so in a way, it's kind of an exponentially expensive representation. But in that exponentially large representation, every function is linear. Every transition, every dynamic is linear. You don't need nonlinearities there. Um, so for example, let's let's imagine you have uh, a very highly nonlinear function, right? Um, even a one-dimensional nonlinear function that maps x to y. Um, how do you make it linear? You expand it onto a very large basis function, right? So you, you break up the input space into little boxes, and you build a very, very long vector whose number of dimension is the number of boxes, and it's a place code. It says, um, I'm going to turn on the kth uh, uh, dimension of that big vector if x falls into the kth box, right? And now every function is linear in that space if you make the box small enough. Um, you know, quantum mechanics uses that too. It's got one dimension per possible state, and so transition is linear. Um, so, um, so it's kind of the same idea here. You expand the dimension into a kind of a sparse space, and things are more likely to be linear then uh, than in whatever you know, native uh, representation you have. Um, so that's a bit of the idea behind this. And the reason you want, you want things to be linear in that space is that the next thing you're going to do is you're going to pull them. You're going to you take all of those, a whole bunch of those sparse vectors, and you're going to add them up, uh, either over the entire image or over little parts of the image. It's a pooling operation. Same thing we were talking about earlier. Less sparse in this case. We can make less sparse. Say again. We become less sparse in, well, after pooling. Right. So after pooling, they're less sparse, but uh, but you're pooling over presumably areas that you know should be pulled over, so it doesn't matter. Why you have to take a very small area for pooling? You know to to fight against this. Uh, the rules of sparsity and after to not to be sensitive to the to the non linearity of the classifier. Right. So I mean there is theoretical analysis of what type of pooling you should use depending on the relative probability of feature being on or off, depending on whether it's on the object or the background. Should you use max pooling or average pooling or LP pooling? Uh, and, that, and the answer, so this was work done by Ilan Mouro in my lab, and um, the answer is that it depends on the size over which you do the pooling and on the relative probability of the feature firing on the object or not. Uh, so if, you, if you're averaging over large areas, uh, you better watch using average pooling, but in small areas, you better watch using max pooling. And then everything in between. Um, uh, isn't the best thing, I mean, let's suppose you've got this sparse thing where you have sparse codes for different views of the same object. Are we talking? And is that does, does that make sparse codes are different view? Let's imagine you've, you know, you've got you've, you've got right. lots of different views of a car, and, right. and what you're pooling, will, you want to stick them all together. So right. So they will activate different subsets of, yeah. of components of the of the feature vector. Yeah. So it's not just it's not uh, spatially 
pooling things together. It, it's picking out all the ones that mean the same thing. So if you knew how to do it, you would pool over things that you know are semantically similar. Okay, you would learn that. So you, uh, you, you learn that, and then you do this. Right. And you, and you, and you use temple uh, uh, or right? So, yeah, so uh, this yeah. 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 you know, do this, and then you got it. Right. So that's what people would do if they were smart. Uh, but in, the, in, in most of those models, that's not what people do. They, uh, they simply pull over space. So it just deals with shooting variance, that's all. Um, but I'll, I'll show you some algorithms later, maybe in the second part. Uh, you can run the pool. Um, so you can apply, you know, convolutional nets, supervised convolutional nets, all kinds of uh, of tasks, uh, you know, of recognition of uh, simple objects, and, and they pretty much all dominate in terms of performance. Uh, so whenever there was some sort of formal competition on things like this or like that, the winner is always a convolutional net. Um, in fact, on this one, this this was a competition organized by this uh, German um, institution a couple of years ago. Uh, 13 of the top 14 uh, entries were convolutional nets, 6 from my lab and 7 from uh, Jürgen Schmiedewer's lab in uh, Switzerland. Uh, he ended up actually winning by 0.01% or something. Um, and you might ask, what's the 14th entry? That's actually human performance. Um, that was number 6. Um, so this is sort of natural uh, you know, recognizing digits in sort of natural environments. This is a database, database produced by Google. Um, and you know, you can use this for sort of pedestrian detection and all kinds of stuff. But um, you know, and then there are sort of temporal versions of this where one of the dimensions is time, and maybe the other one will be frequency or channels. Um, and we apply this to all kinds of stuff. You know, prediction of epilepsy seizures. Uh, and there are you know industrial applications of convolutional nets that are going back to the mid '90s. Uh, some of which that are built for handwriting recognition. Uh, some more recent ones by uh, NEC for things like vending machine that figure out the age and, age and gender of a person in front of it and advertising posters that do the same and various other applications. Google uh, uses it for face and license plate um, uh, detection and removal from street view images. Well, they used to, I'm not sure they still, they still do. Um, so various other applications. That is a growing list. Uh, but here's kind of the coolest latest application of it, that uh, this is purely supervised convolutional nets, no magic, no sort of more recent deep learning tricks in this. Um, and the problem is to label uh, every pixel uh, in an image with the category of the object that it belongs to, right? So here you have an image, you have sky building and roads and cars and, you know, uh, people and, you know, doors and windows and trees and water. Um, so what we use for that is uh, a convolutional net, a kind of a multi-scale convolutional net, if you want. Um, and so you take the uh, you take the input, you run it through three copies of a convolutional net, but the input is being subsampled at, at three different scales, basically the factors of two. Okay. So it's original resolution, half resolution, quarter resolution. You run this through three copies of the same convolutional net. And of course, convolutional net doesn't doesn't care what size input you feed it because it just does a convolution over the input. Uh, it just applies a bunch of filters, and so if you change the size of the input, the size of the output will change, but otherwise, you know, it still works, right? Um, so the convolutional net, so this is, you know, first stage and second stage, uh, there's some subsampling going on. And, of course, those three convolutional nets will produce uh, uh, feature maps of different sizes, uh, because they're applied to images of different sizes. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to upsample the, the feature the feature is produced by the first the, the second convolutional net so that it matches the resolution of the first one here by just copying values and then do the same for that and we concatenate all the features so we get this giant feature map so so this would typically have 256 features that size here would be essentially the size of the inputs maybe divided by four if we do a four uh, fourfold uh, subsampling in the pooling um, and this would be half the size but we expand it. So we have uh, three uh, sets of feature maps of 256 uh, feature maps. When we concatenate them, uh, we get you know 768 uh, uh, values for every uh, location in those uh, retinotopic maps. Um, and I've kind of represented here uh, by back projecting back on the inputs every single vector here. When you well, I mean, then this goes into kind of a classifier where the number of 
Um, planes here is the number of categories you want to classify, typically 30 or so. And then the size, of course, is the same size as that. And that's a linear operation plus a uh, you know, sigma nonlinearity or a, a multi way uh, softmax. Okay, so now what we can do is we can try to trace back for one particular output here, which corresponds to one particular location in the image, one particular pixel patch in, in the image. What is this influenced by? So if we trace back, you know, this guy has a receptive field of some size, and this guy, you know, has a receptive field of subsampling of some size, blah, blah, blah. We go back to the inputs. Uh, we design the network so that the size of the input that influences this particular output is 46 by 46 pixels. Okay. So the decision as to what category the central pixel of this window is, is made on the basis of the 46 by 46 window of pixels around that given pixel. Right? But there is another path here coming from here, and because it's the same conventional net, the window here is going to be also 46 by 46 pixels, but because that's half resolution, that corresponds to a 92 by 92 pixel on the original image at half res, right? And then this guy is going to look at 184 by 184 window. So every decision here for whether a particular pixel belongs to a category uh, uses a huge window of 184 by 184 window around, around that pixel. So if you see a gray pixel, you're going to know if it's, uh, you know, if it's a cloud or a road or a piece of building or, or you know, a gray shirt because, um, because you see everything around it. And the cool thing about the fact that the, the whole architecture is convolutional is that it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg uh, because you know, everything is basically convolutional. There's a lot of shared computation going on between each of those decisions. Is 46 by 46 a magic number at all? Or? It's just uh, what it comes out to if you use, you know, uh, 7 by 7 filters and 2 by 2 sets of That's good. Okay. So it's not because you, you haven't tried a range and said right. that works best. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, basically also we're interested in running this on a particular piece of FPGA. <coughs> so, uh, the FPGA can deal with 9 by 9 filters. I think we use 9 by 9 filters. Um, oh, no, it says here, 7 by 7. Yeah, so that's a function two by two pooling, right? So it's a function, right? So you start by one, then here the size seven by seven. Here's fourteen by fourteen. Uh, here it's uh, uh, you have to add six, so it'd be uh, twenty by twenty, forty by forty, plus six forty six by forty six. Right. Uh, so in fact, what we do is we take the image and we build a high, you know uh, this is kind of the contrast normalization uh, operation I was telling you about earlier. Uh, so we uh, I pass filter the image and locally normalize the contrast um, to get this. And we do the same at three different scales. You can think of this as some sort of a Laplacian pyramid. Contrast normalized Laplacian pyramid. Then you apply the functional net, concatenate the features. And then you do something very simple, very stupid in fact. Um, in parallel to doing this, so what you get here when you, so the way you train this network is you train it with fully labeled images where you know the category of every pixel. Someone has actually gone through the image and outlined every region and told you this is a cow. Every pixel within this region is a cow. Um, and you know, everything here is grass and blah, blah, blah. So there are a few data sets of, of that around and we use one of those. Um, typically it's a couple thousand images or so um, that are fully labeled. Um, and when you run the convolutional net and you make the decision as to what category a particular pixel is at any location, you get kind of a fuzzy map a little bit. The, the boundaries are not very clear. You know, the network is not sure whether that pix particular pixel belongs to a cow or, be or belongs to you know, uh, the fence behind the, be behind the cow or, or whatever. Um, and so we do something very simple to, get to bring our, our numbers up. Uh, we do a super pixel segmentation, so basically it's just a segmentation of the image based purely on local uh, similarity of uh, pixel colors. Okay? And the thing finds small regions where the boundary of the regions are lined up with the, uh, the edges of the, uh, of the image. The segmentation is unsupervised? So? There's no training, it's just super pixels. I mean, it's very well understood. It's basically federal person swaps uh, oh. super pixels. It's very fast, it's very simple, it's, it's basically a graph cut type of um, and so you get those small regions. Uh, it's an over segmentation in the sense that you'll, you'll have regions that uh, are segmented out that, you know, that are separated from each other, which actually belong to the same object, but that doesn't matter to us. Um, 
the, the, the main question is whether regions that are you know, from different objects will actually be uh, in different uh, components. And then what we do is uh, we compute, we vote the, we do a vote of the categories within a super, a super pixel and we assign uh, all the pixels within the super pixel to the winning category, the one that has the largest combined probability over the, over the super pixel as given by our conventional net. Okay, and that sort of cleans up the boundary. So instead of having those kind of fuzzy boundary, you know, we, the, the categories are kind of lined up with the edges in the image. It's very simple. This costs, you know, peanuts compared to this. Uh, there's a different way of doing it with purity tree, which is much more complicated and doesn't work particularly better, a little better, but not much. So here is the first table result. This is on this so-called Stanford background data set, which a lot of people have experimented with. And the first column here is pixel accuracy. So this is just counting how many pixels you get right on the test set. And the class accuracy is kind of normalized by the frequency of the class. So this, you can get high numbers here by just basically getting the sky and the road and the mountains right, because most pixels are either sky or road, okay? So if you get the boundary between those two right, you're gonna get fairly high numbers. And you can completely miss the people and the cars and the things like that, it won't matter much because there are a few pixels. So it doesn't look like, it doesn't sound like a fair measure of accuracy. This one makes you pay more for missing an important object, let's say a person, okay? And so it, it, uh, it basically, it says, um, you, know, uh, you know, how many of the skies did you get right? How many of the, how many of the sky pixels did you get? What proportion of sky pixels did you get right? What proportion of uh, ground pixels did you get right? What proportion of person pixels did you get right? And then you average those. And so it takes out the fact that you have way fewer pixel people than uh, you know, people pixels than you have sky pixels. And so it's a much better measure of accuracy. And we basically beat everyone here. Uh, on this measure, we're kind of pretty much the same level below these guys uh, on the per pixel accuracy. Um, but we're 100 times faster. And why is this? So most of those methods are very slow. And the reason they're, they're slow is because they use fairly sim simple um, recognition algorithms to figure out a label for each pixel. And the window, the contextual window that's used to, to make this decision is fairly small. And then they rely on a very sort of heavy machinery, graphical model machinery, to make consistent decisions, uh, basically taking context into account. Um, and then so you have to run a sort of you know, approximate inference algorithm on this big uh, graphical model to figure out what the right answer is. And that's what takes uh, you know, 10 minutes or a minute. Um, and so most of those methods take, take context into account using essentially a feedback complicated inference in graphical models, but use a fairly simple uh, recognition system. And in some of those use CRFs and things like this. Um, whereas this one has, or, you know, our method basically has a very simple feed forward uh, 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 system overall, but it's, uh, the, the only inference there is is this kind of voting over super pixels. Um, but the decision for every pixel takes a huge context, and so there is no need for this sort of complex relaxation afterwards, or less need for it. Uh, so in fact, we did uh, something in the sneaky, which is to combine this sort of complex uh, CRF type uh, graphical model on top of the things that we produce with the system. And, uh, and that, you know, certainly better results than if we don't do this, but at a cost, that's just not worth the trouble. Of course, there's our, there's our accuracies on the um, scenes that have, have been, well, um, fixed uh, static scenes that have yeah. never, never been seen before. Yes, yes. Yeah. This is test set, yeah. When, when people compare the computation time, are, are these sort of standardized or standard hardware? Or? Yeah, you know, it's, it's hardware of the day. I mean, most people have, you know, multi core. I mean, this is not using giant clusters. Right, I mean, you're not allowed to just uh, put big blue in. No. <laughs> no, this would be on your, your standard uh, MacBook Pro. Uh, so this is another data set, much more challenging, but more interesting, called the Cipro data set. Um, and same kind of result here. We, uh, so the much fewer people have tried this. So this is just a raw convolutional net I put uh, we uh, already beat the record on class accuracy, although not on the pixel accuracy. And then you combine with these, 
uh, superpixel voting or uh, all this cover which I didn't describe. And uh, you know, it can be the state of the art, either pixel accuracy and you can completely blow the state of the art on the class, um, class normalized uh, accuracy. The difference between those two lines is that this guy is, this guy is trying to do a good job on pixel accuracy and this guy is trying to do a good job on normalized class accuracy. Okay? So we just change the sampling so that we get good performance on what we want to get good performance on. Uh, this one is extremely challenging uh, data set with uh, 170 categories and of course the performance is pretty, pretty atrocious uh, but it's better than what people were doing before. This is actually out of Lana uh, group at uh, University of North Carolina which is not good you see. Um, so this works really well, these are results, uh, two results on the CFLOW data set, uh, pretty much gets all the regions uh, pretty well. Uh, you know, mountain, sky, road, fence, building, um, window. Are you using color in here at all, or is it just grayscale? Uh, this is color, yeah. yeah it's, uh, it, it, I think it's what you need. Uh, sea, water, sand, etc. So. Um, we mounted this on the, you see there's a guy on the bike here, you see this shadow. He's got a funny hat with uh, uh, mm. four red cans, or six red cans, uh, to do the money can. Uh, he's running around uh, Washington Square Park, which is at the heart of uh, NYU. And we're kind of running this algorithm on this. Um, you see. Okay, so that's the video. Um, so it's labeling, you know, it knows this is a car, that's the road. Sometimes this is a beach. Uh, you know, it's sous les pavés de plage. Even in New York. Um, car building, sky. It makes some stupid mistakes sometimes. Um, you know, everything that's red or purple is kind of an object that's different from that building. You know, like, so it shouldn't be an object. It takes a person here. Is this using any sort of memory at all, or every frame? Every frame is uh, independent. Um, so, you know, it's river here. It's not a river, but... Um, and when the lighting is bad, you get a funny effect. But, uh, it works pretty well. So, um, this system runs on a, on a sort of a MacBook Pro runs about two frames per second at that resolution. Um, and we have a piece of specialized hardware, a PGA base, where uh, the, the convolutional, convolutional net part of it runs in 15 milliseconds per frame. Problem is, to get the features out of the board uh, takes 300 milliseconds, so we can actually <laughs> run it in real time. But soon, soon we'll have the whole thing integrated. Um, how many glasses do you recognize? How many glasses? 33. So how long until we have that on the iPhone? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, so Clément Faraday, who is the person who is doing most of this work, is creating a company on this. So. Maybe soon. Uh, that's, so this one is another example where we use uh, spatial temporal consistency. So now the, the super pixels, instead of being just uh, image uh, you know, frame by frame are actually over time, so they're kind of spatial temporal super pixels. And there's a voting over time as well. And so it gives a little more consistency in, uh, in, uh, over time, but it makes more mistakes, uh, fortunately. But it's more stable. And it's a, it's a very sort of simple-minded way of doing it. So it thinks this building is a tree, which is, of course, not true. Well, then it figures it out. Um, Okay, uh, so in the last uh, 20 minutes, the first thing I'll kind of introduce uh, sort of more the, the topic of deep learning really. Because this was, I mean, everything that I talked about so far, it seems that we could have done in 1992, basically. Um, except we didn't have the computers that were fast enough, we didn't have the data. But the ideas were there. Uh, the neural net I just showed you, uh, you know, we had that technology essentially almost 20 years ago. Um, just not the hardware to run it on, um, or to train it, certainly not the data. Um, we also didn't have the idea that this could actually work, <laughs> uh, but it does. Um, so uh, so the, the, the main idea of uh, deep learning that has kind of revived interest in the, in the topic over the last uh, six, or seven, six years or so 
is the idea that you can pre-train those systems using unsupervised learning. Um, and that seems to make a big difference for certain tasks. Uh, not all of them, but uh, tasks for which you have a fairly small number of label samples. Uh, tasks where the network you're trying to train is not a commercial net, but it's kind of a unstructured, fully connected net, and you know those things are very hard to train with that deep. Uh, but if you pre-train them using unsupervised training, then uh, we can get something out of them. Um, and this has been incredibly successful recently in speech recognition. So it's not something I've worked on, although I'm starting to work on speech recognition. So it's done uh, mostly by uh, uh, Jeff Hinton, largely a little bit by Andrew Ng, and then by people in various companies, uh, mostly uh, uh, Google, Microsoft, and IBM. Um, and been incredibly successful. There's also successful applications of, of, of this in natural language processing and things like that. Okay, but before I talk about specifically about deep learning, I want to talk about a general view of unsupervised learning. What is really unsupervised learning all about? Uh, what are we trying to do with unsupervised learning? And, and unsupervised learning is really the idea of capturing dependencies between variables. And in the process of doing this, we're going to extract a representation of this uh, of, of the data. Um, so if you have a probabilistic view of, of the world, uh, you can think of unsupervised learning as basically density estimation, right? I give you a bunch of points and you have to produce a function that will tell, tell me, if I give it a vector, it gives me the probability density function of that, uh, value of the probability density function of that point. Okay? So something like this, right? Uh, where if you have lots of training samples here, some more training samples there, and almost nothing outside, then you want some sort of density function that looks like this. Of course, the problem is hellishly complicated in high dimension. Uh, but of course, but, but I'm going to kind of change this into sort of an energy-based view, which is um, it's sometimes complicated to parameterize a probabilistic fu uh, a density function in such a way that it's always normalized. And so sometimes it's much easier and more flexible to actually go through an energy function, which you can think of as kind of the negative log of a probability function, without the normalization. Okay? So it would be a function that we take low value in areas of high point density, and high values uh, in areas of low density. Okay. Uh, so something like this. Let's say I have those training samples here. <coughs> and those training samples are such that uh, y is always, equals to, uh, always equal to x squared. Okay, so that's what, those are my training samples. That's a very strong dependency between y and x. In fact, it's a deterministic dependency, not even probabilistic. So what I'd like is some sort of energy function that looks like this, that gives me low energy around the data points and high energy everywhere else. Right? And those are two perfectly fine energy functions that will fit the bill. Um, and the learning problem, if I want to run an energy function like this, the learning problem is going to be, how do I design a surface in such a way that the surface has not only low values around the, the, the beads, which is easy to do, but also higher values everywhere else. And that's the hard part. Okay, so uh, here's a badly designed learning algorithm running here. Uh, what it does is that uh, it, uh, it tries to pull down on the, on the blue beads, okay, on the data points. And by pulling down on the data points because of the nature of the energy function, the energy function gets flat. It's not a good model. Because it's not a good model because it doesn't, we can't use it as a contrast function between areas where the data uh, is and areas where the data isn't. I should say data um, Here is a slightly better one. Um, so here we train this model again. And, uh, and this one is designed in such a way that it can't be flat. It's just built into the energy function that it cannot go flat. Uh, it has to have a kink in it. And the only thing you can do is move the kink. And so this guy here learns without any problem. If you pull down on the blue beads uh, in such a way that you tweak the parameters of the energy function in such a way that the blue beads are as low as possible, which is basically pretty in the sense, um, you know, it gets the right shape. Here's another one here where we do a slightly different strategy. So here, our function is essentially the same parameterization as here. But here, or the loss function we minimize to shape the energy function has two terms. It has one term that pulls down on the blue beads, and it has another term that pulls up on everything else. Okay? And so it's like, you know, you push down on, the, on those blue points and then you pull up on everything around them. And so you're going to get a, a groove and your energy function is going to take the right shape. Now, uh, 
In fact, it turns out for this, I used a, a kind of probabilistic loss function, maximum likelihood of, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that later. Uh, but you could use other loss functions. Okay, so if, you're, if, you're, if you like probabilities, you, you can always turn energy functions into probability distributions using the Gibbs, um, the, the, the Gibbs distribution. Uh, take uh, e to the minus some positive parameter, uh, the energy function for a particular data point y, and then normalize by the integral of this over y, and what you get is a normalized uh, density over y, and, um, and you can declare that that's the density that your model uh, produces. Um, <coughs> so you can always go from energy to probability as long as this uh, denominator function here, first of all, uh, exists, because it could diverge, and second of all, is tractable, because in most cases, interesting cases, that integral is basically tractable. Um, but if you forget about this, if you just play with energies, then you don't need to worry about this too much. So what can we use this for? Um, well, uh, for example, uh, if we had a perfect, if I, if I give you a box, and that box told you, uh, that box could take as, in, as input an image, and it would have a single output, the single output would say zero if this image actually is a natural image, and something else larger than zero if the image looks bad. If it's noisy, if it's distorted, if it's, you know, looks unnatural somehow. Um, if you had this box, you could do perfect denoising of images, right? Because you could feed a noisy image to your function, um, which would be kind of a, oh, this one is the energy form. So it'd be a, a high energy function if it's noisy, and then you could kind of try to find a low energy uh, image that's nearby this one that happens to uh, be low energy, which means it's natural, because your box tells you if it's an image natural, and then you can declare that this is a denoised version of that image. Okay. Um, Right, so here is the uh, probabilistic approach to unsupervised learning. It's maximum likelihood. You, um, you build your probabilistic model this way. So you have an energy function, and the probability of a particular point is e to the minus the energy of that point, divided by the so-called partition function, which is the normalization term. And for any particular point, so what you want to do training is that you want to uh, maximize the probability that your model gives to any data point. And because it's normalized, it's going to give low probability to everything else, obviously, right? Uh, if it gives high probability to some points, it will have to give low probability to other points, necessarily, because of normalization. Um, so if I have a particular data point here, maybe I should do gradient descent, you know, so as to tweak the parameter vector here, the parameters, in such a way that this energy goes down, and in such a way that this normalization uh, term doesn't go down, maybe goes up. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this normalization term goes down. So what you want is you want the energy to go down, you want this probability to go up, and you want this to uh, either go down or at least not go up too much. Okay? Because that's the way you make the probability hard, high. And what that means is that you, you have to make all of those energies as large as possible. Okay? So, in fact, the, the loss function is the negative log likelihood. So you take the negative log of this, and you divide by beta because it's more convenient, you get this loss function. So for a particular data point y, the loss function you need to minimize with respect to the parameters is the energy for that point. Okay, make this small. To minimize this function, you have to make this small. And you have to make this small, and to make this small is the log of the sum of the exponentials of the energies for all the points, or all points. And to make this entire thing small, you have to make all of those energies large. Okay? So basically the effect of minimizing this with respect to the parameters is going to be for a particular point, data point y, is going to be to push down on the energy of the data point y, and then push up on the energies of everything else. And of course the problem is, you don't know how to do this because, you know, how the hell are you going to compute the gradient of this integral with respect to w? Unless your energy function is something simple like the Gaussian, like, you know, a quadratic function, which means this is a Gaussian. Um, so you can compute the, the derivative or the gradient of this with respect to the parameters, and you get something like this. The gradient of the loss function with respect to the parameters is equal to the gradient of the energy at the data point with respect to the parameters, minus the gradient of this uh, log partition function, or plus the gradient of the loss part, uh, log partition function. And uh, you have to believe me that it's equal to that. So it's basically the expected value under the probability uh, computed by the model of the gradient 
of the energy with respect to the parameters at every point in the space, and that has a negative sign in front of it, which means all those energies are going to try to go up. Okay, so the force with which an energy is going to be pulled up is proportional to the probability that the model gives to this point. So if a point has a very low energy, it's going to be pulled up really, really hard. But if it has already a high energy, then it's not going to be pulled up very hard, very hard. Because that probability is going to be low. High energy, low probability. <coughs> so that's the probabilistic view of things. And the big problem of this, of course, is that you have this horrible integral here, which is, you know, you could approximate with, uh, there's a lot of papers in the machine learning literature that has to do with how you approximate this term. Um, not just for unsupervised learning, also for supervised learning, where the, the, the space of y is very large. Uh, so for, for supervised learning, you get exactly the same form, except you have an x in addition to the w. Everything is conditional upon, upon x. Okay. Um, and so you can approximate this using Monte Carlo method. This is a, a typical type of integral you can approximate with Monte Carlo. Basically, you, you draw a sample from this distribution, and you compute the gradient of the energy at that sample, and then uh, tweak the parameters so that the energy of that point goes up. And then you draw another sample. And if you draw enough samples, you approximate this integral. Right? You can also do variational methods where you say, well, I don't know what this probability distribution is because it's intractable, but I'm going to find another probability distribution that I can compute that I'm going to make as close as possible to this one as I can, and then I'm going to do this. So there's all kinds of methods to do this, and there's a lot of papers in machine learning that do this. Um, there's a, really, there's a bunch of really neat tricks, um, and that's what I'm going to uh, end with uh, for now. Uh, the first trick is uh, something called contrasted divergence. Uh, and this is a trick due to Hinton about five years ago. Um, and the idea is the following. So if you remember this picture, this little animation uh, I had. So, what you want here, you want to avoid the situation where the energy function is flat, right? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a sample. Um, so what you should really do is what this does, which is uh, pick a training sample, pull down on it, and then pick a sample anywhere in the space and pull up on it. And then if, you, if your space is small enough, you're going to cover the entire possible space and you're going to pull up on, on everything. It's basically a Monte Carlo way of approximating the integral I was telling you about. But that's too expensive in a high dimensional space. There's no way you can do this. And so Hinton said, well, we really don't really care about the shape of the energy function far away from the data points. The only thing we care about is that near the data points, the energy function takes the right shape, okay, as a group, essentially. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a sample. We're going to pull down on the energy of that sample, modifying the parameters of the energy function so that it goes down. okay. And then we're going to uh, give a little kick a little pitch net, you know, to this uh, sample, and so that it kind of rolls around uh, this uh, energy surface. And we're going to stop after a while, and then the new samples that we get, we're going to pull up on the energy of that. Okay. So the little pitch net kick thing is um, uh, basically a informal way of saying we're going to run a uh, you know hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm. Um, or, or Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithm, or some, some Markov chain Monte Carlo process that starts from the data point and then moves away from it so that it gets a point outside of the manifold of data, not necessarily, I mean, it could be on the manifold of data, but generally not. And we're going to move in such a way that we preferentially move towards uh, low energies, but there is some chance of moving up because of the kick, the original kick. Okay? And so for every training sample, we get a sort of contrastive training sample, which is not too far away from it. <coughs> uh, generated by this little Marco Chen Monte Carlo process. We push down on the energy of the sample, we push up on the energy of that contrasted sample. And then we keep doing this for all the samples. That's contrasted divergence. You can apply this to all kinds of stuff. In particular to uh, restricted Boson machines, which is what Jeff Hinton is interested in. Uh, I have a question about the energy landscape here. Yeah. Uh, the way the energy is defined, is it um, <coughs> simply by looking at the states? Um, so you basically look at the activation of the units and multiply it by all the weights that come. So I'd be very careful not to specify anything about the, uh, how the energy surface is parameterized right now. It's basically anything you want. Any function that goes from you know, any input to one output. Okay. It doesn't matter. It could be a neural net, it could be a mixture of Gaussians, it could 
Well, it makes a little difference. I mean, uh, so, so, so the system has to start on a flat energy landscape, or no. that can be random? No, no, it's, you initialize it randomly if you want. Okay. And you can design the energy surface in such a way that it's, uh, if you, if you want to be uh, uh, safe, you can design it in such a way that, that it, it has this property that it can't be flat. Mm -hmm. Okay? But most of the interesting ones are like, are like this one. Um, because you're mentioning that one, one, one of the things you want to have is um, an energy landscape in which uh, indeed we have low energy regions um, at, the, at, the, at the adequate paces yeah. and high energy regions uh, elsewhere. elsewhere. Uh, I, I was thinking that an, another requirement maybe could be that uh, lots of different initial conditions are going to lead to, lead to that. And it, it does this sure. yeah. yeah, I mean, you might have local minima problem. For example, you train mixture of gas models. Mixture of gas and models, you don't you don't get the same solution every time because you know mm. it's it's got lots of local minima. So yeah, you, you might be hit by local minima problems. Mm. But you know I'm not I'm not specifying how we parameterize the energy function. Um, I'll I'll come to that in the second half. But um, okay, here is another idea: score mm. matching. So score matching is uh, this is a algorithm due to uh, Apo Nivarinen in Finland. And the idea of this is, at the data point, you make sure that the gradient of the energy function with respect to the input, not with respect to the parameters, is zero. So in other words, you make sure that the, the, um, uh, the data points are local minima, or local extrema, of the uh, energy function. And at the same time, at every data point, you maximize the trace of the Hessian of the energy function with respect to uh, the input so that you make sure it curves up. Okay. It's a very cute idea, except it's completely impractical for very complex models because you have to compute the derivative of the trace of the Hessian with respect to the parameters. And it's just a big pain in that. Um, for anything else than linear models, unless you have automatic differentiation systems that can deal with, sec you know, second order, blah, 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 which only two guys in the world have. Um, Barakometer and um, anyway, uh, uh, third solution uh, and fourth solution is to use what's called uh, uh, sort of versions of autoencoders or Spassky, uh or other versions of this. And I don't want to go into this now, so I'll uh, stop you and take questions uh, for the next speaker, and I'll talk about this in a second. 